Joshua chapter number 1. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success." Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Now, we read it in verse number 1 and 2. book of Joshua starts as the position of Joshua changed. He was Moses' minister. Now, he is the leader of God's people. That wasn't the people's decision. What Moses' decision, it said that God pointed him out. It said, nope, Joshua's going to be next. Okay, whether Joshua, I'm sure Joshua, very satisfied being the minister of Moses, the minister for the people, or for the minister of God's people. He'd seen things that nobody else saw. There were times where it was just Moses and Joshua, and God would come down to a pillar of cloud, talk to Moses at the opening of the tabernacle. Joshua was just inside that doorway, fell down on his face, started praying. Right, Joshua had seen some things. I don't know that Joshua necessarily, Brother Brian, Brother Brian you know, signed up and said, yeah, give me all that responsibility. Right, but nowhere do we see where he questions it. To his credit, we don't see that Moses is experienced, well, Lord, I can't go. i got to stutter. Right, well, Lord, if, if I'm going to have to go down there, at least give me somebody to help me. Give me Aaron. Right? No, we don't see any of that. Joshua just says, okay, let's go. I mean, we can continue reading the chapter. Verse number 10 says, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people. He said, all right, God said, do it, let's do it. Okay, well, what did God tell him to do? First he said, hey, go over Jordan, and everywhere from the wilderness that y'all spent 40 years in, all the way to the great U river Euphrates, down to the great sea, he says, everywhere that you walk, I'm going to give that land to you. I mean, in fact, it was verse number 3, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread, there have I given it unto you, as I said unto Moses. Okay, And then in verse number 2, he said, Go over Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them. God said, I'm giving it to you right now. Go get it. He says, it's been promised for all these years. They called it the promise of the land because God had promised it. But today, he said, today is the day that everything has gone according to plan. Israel's gotten to where I've told them to be. And today, I give it to you. He said, everywhere you walk, it's yours. And then, he goes on to command Joshua, be strong and of good courage. He says, you're going to have to divide the land among the people for their inheritance. Twelve tribes, you've got to divvy it up into twelve parts. But he says, further than that, only be thou strong and very courageous, in verse number 7, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. And then at the end of the verse it says, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. He says, go and take it, but go in the way that I commanded you to. And he says, just because the land's yours now doesn't mean that you get to do whatever you want. You're still responsible for your own actions. Then, verse number 8, the book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then, sh and then thou shalt have good success. 
He says, until you get to the point that your words match the words of the law of God, when you meditate on it day and night, when the things of God are more than just a part of you, they become you. You wholly give yourself to the things of God. Where the advice that you give sounds like the advice of God, because that's where it came from. Right? When someone cusses you out in traffic, well, Jesus loves you, instead of horn cussing them right back, right? About that, almost did that on the way in today. Guy had to slow down two miles an hour to make a turn. But, didn't do it. But what was that? That was just by the grace of God that I didn't get myself into more trouble. What he's talking to Joshua here is, you're the leader of God. You have to get to the point where everything that you say is directed by and according to what thus saith the Lord. He says, when you get to that point, then you'll be prosperous and then you'll have good success. So what does Joshua do? We don't see him say, well, it sounds a little bit too hard. Let's not do that. He purposes himself to do such. Verse number 10, we already said, he commanded the officers of the people. He said, okay, this is what God said to do. He didn't wait and say, well, in three days the lane's still going to be over there. No, no, no. God said he gave it to us now. Now is when we start. Johnny on the spot. He was ready to go. But verse number 9, have not, I commanded thee. God doesn't ask questions for no reason. Every time God asks a question, there's a deliberate reason for it. Of course God just commanded him. But really what he's saying is, Joshua, if I told you that it's going to happen, who else can change it? I have commanded it. He said, I promised, today I give. I've commanded you to go get it. Who's going to stop you? Have I not commanded it? I mean, when I read this, the thing that comes to mind is the centurion that came to Jesus who had the daughter that was sick, and then later the daughter had passed away. What did that centurion tell Jesus? He says, I have authority. And because of my authority, when I command soldiers underneath of me to go and do something, he says, I know it's done because I've commanded it. He says, as soon as I say it, in my mind, it's as good as already done. And by that reasoning, by faith, he said, and you're the Lord of all creation. So if you say that my daughter be healed, she'll be healed. He says, I have no doubt. Well, that's what God's saying to Joshua here. I have commanded it. What in heaven or earth or under the earth is capable of changing what God has commanded? Who is capable of altering what God says will happen? He has commanded it. Well, you can go for six chapters. We don't have time to read all of it, and y'all are thankful that I'm not going to read all of it. But here in six chapters, we're going to find the story of Jericho, how the walls fell flat, didn't say crumbled, because if something crumbles, it's still up on top of the ground. I right? didn't say that the walls tipped over, because these were some big walls. And a big wall that's, you know, really thick, if it falls this way, it's still pretty tall. It says that they walked over on flat ground. Well, what's that mean? Well, I believe that the earth swallowed up, you know, opened up and swallowed up the walls. Just they walked across just like it was, you know, pavement stones. Because it said flat. Didn't say that, you know, they had to build some ladders and then get over the rubble. No, no, no. God said, hey, you go around and then I'll open up the city. There was nothing left for the city to be. You can defend a hill. You can set up, you know, formations and, you know, a big dirt mound. I mean, there are times that that's all George Washington had. At one time, they happened upon some Native Americans and then they had to build Fort Necessity. I don't know if y'all remember that from school. You know how big Fort Necessity was? About 18 inches of wood that they hurriedly cut and then drove into the ground. You can make anything into a defense if you're desperate enough. God removed all possibility of defense. Right? Everything's going according to plan. They're just doing what God told them to do. Joshua every day, he's saying, okay, 
This, this, these are the law that Moses commanded us. This is how we're going to do it. And we're just by faith going to follow God as best we can. And then chapter 7 comes. In chapter number 7, that's when a couple thousand men go out against the men of Ai. And when they go to fight Ai, God wasn't with them. 36 men died that day. The rest of them came back. And Joshua, shaking to his core, he said, wait, something not right here. God said he gave it to us. He said that nobody would be able to stand against us. He falls down on his face in the tabernacle pleading with God. And we're going to look at a few other examples. But Joshua did everything right. Those 36 men that died, they did everything right. Every, out of all of Israel, some millions that were in the wilderness, all but one did right. And yet it still went wrong. That's what the Lord's up this morning. We're going to teach on. When you do right, but it goes wrong. When you do right, but it goes wrong. I can't help but imagine that there's somebody up in the middle of those riots who knows God that's trying to live God and then one day they go to bed and the next day they wake up and their store got burned down. Somebody that's just doing right. They've done everything that they know to do. But even though they've done right, they wake up and it's all gone wrong. Well, what was Joshua's answer that he got from God? He said, there's sin in the camp. He said, somebody didn't do as God commanded. And then we know the story of Achan. They go and they find that silver, the wedge of gold, and the Babylonian garment. And then because of Achan's mistake, him, all of his sons, all of his daughters, his oxen, his donkey, everything that he had was taken down to the valley of Achor. They were stoned. Why? Because of that one man's sin, 36 families died that day. Or 36 men died that day. 36 families heard a report that well, we went out to battle, but because somebody did wrong, even though your son or your husband or your brother, well, it probably wasn't their son because the older generation died away, your husband, your father, your brother, your cousin, your best friend, he's not coming back. Even though he did everything right, he didn't make it back. But imagine when Joshua hears there's sin in the camp. God didn't tell him who it was. They had to go search it out. Can you imagine all those people as the news is passed throughout all the camp? They're sitting in the camp. And for a moment, they're all shaking in their court. Did I do something that caused these 36 men to lose their lives? Did I misunderstand? Did I ignorantly do something that was against the commandments of God? That dread, that feeling for a moment of am I the one I think that that's what 10 of the disciples felt at the last supper John knew that he wasn't he wasn't going to be the one to you know, betray him but the rest of them they all asked is it I Judas knew it was him but he still asked but 10 for a second said well hang on a second do I not love him as much as I thought I loved him anybody ever had that moment happen in your life something just come up caught you by surprise God knew it was going to happen but in the flesh or as the one that said Lord help mine unbelief in a moment of unbelief you can think well what did I do wrong what did I do that allowed this to happen well Joshua gets the answer and he says there's sin in the camp if Joshua would have had, you know, Joshua, he's already done what we said in chapter number one. He's applied himself. And for 40 years, he's prepared himself to take over as the leader of God's people. He's studying under Moses. He knows the law. He studied. He was Moses' minister. Of course he knew it. He taught it to other people. So when God said there's sin in the camp, Joshua knew it wasn't him. But what about them 36 families? You ever think, well, how come my loved one didn't get to come? Was it something that he did? 
Imagine if your dad didn't come back and then you hear through the grapevine that there was sin in the camp. Well, if dad did something wrong, does that mean that he taught me wrong? Does that mean that I need to go figure out what he did wrong and the things that he was teaching us that were wrong so that I can make them right? Imagine the panic, the dismay. We're going somewhere. But as I'm thinking, there's another person one day, he did right. Somehow it still went wrong. Man's name was Elijah. He prayed down fire from heaven. Well, no. He prayed and then God sent fire down from heaven. Let's be specific there. But he was obedient. Did everything. In fact, when he prayed, he says, I've done everything that you've commanded me, Lord, so that God can show out. He said, I want you to show up in such a big way that I got myself out of the way. I did everything you said, and Lord, now I can't do no more. It's in your hands. Then after fire comes down, all the people start chanting, the Lord, he is the God. The prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove are slain. And then not too long after, there's a death threat, a warrant for the head of Elijah. Now imagine you're Elijah. For so long, you've been prophesying again. You've been preaching. You've been warning about this evil woman named Jezebel. About the evil that's going on at the king's house. About how they're leading God's people away. And after so long of being patient, so many years of just trusting that God one day would show up in a great and mighty way, he did. And I can sympathize with Elijah. Okay. I've, for better or for worse, this is the way that I am, Brother Peter. If God says it, in my mind, okay. Right, we have a great service like we did a few Sunday mornings ago. Okay. Let's keep it going. Right, well, if God says to go left, we're going left. It's already settled. And I could see Elijah saying, okay, all them people just saw fire from, fall down from heaven. He expected revival to show up. It hadn't happened yet, but, I mean, we could go over and look at Jonah. Jonah shows up and preaches revival. Nineveh, everybody, from the king down to the animals, they get right with God. Amen. That's what Elijah's expecting to happen. But those people that said, the Lord, he is the God, they forgot that. Or they feared the queen more than they feared God. Because we don't find anybody taking up the cause of the Lord Almighty. In fact, we see a whole bunch of people just roll over when the queen says, bring me Elijah's head. And they say, okay. Nobody said, yeah, but you remember the, the God of Elijah prayed down fire from, or you know, sent down fire from heaven after your prophets couldn't do it all day long? Sitting there cutting themselves, mutilating themselves, dancing, hooping and hollering, making a whole bunch of noise, and nothing happened. And then he prayed something that was really short and wasn't all that poetic. Wasn't all that intellectual. It's just, all right, Lord, I've done what you said. And for your honor and your glory, I pray that you do what you said you was going to do. And then God did it. Nobody stood up and said, yeah, but you remember what just happened? Everybody forgot. Then Elijah's under the juniper tree thinking, Lord, how did it all go so right but then it end up so wrong? Then God had to tell him, you know, I've got a whole bunch that haven't bowed down to Baal. He said, I've got a remnant. He said, it may have gone wrong here, but he says it's going right other places. But more importantly, Elijah realizes he did right. He did all that he could do. In the eyes of God, Elijah, overwhelming success. Why? Because he did not just what God said, down to the very finest detail, he performed it all out of a love for God and a desire to see God do something for God's people. But can you imagine sitting underneath that juniper tree? Or the walk to the juniper tree? Lord, did, did I do something wrong? I thought I did it all right. Did I overlook something? Can you imagine David sitting there miserable? David did wrong. That's when he took Bathsheba. Okay, did wrong. But can you imagine the feeling that he's at? He's just sitting there and God's left him. There's no presence. He's sitting there and he's saying, Lord, what's different? Well, in that case, he got an answer. 
But can you imagine being Elijah and thinking, well, no, I did that. I did this. I followed that instruction. God sent the fire to... God wouldn't have sent fire if it, something was out of order. So what didn't I do afterwards? Should I have said something to the king or the queen? Or should I have rallied the people to overthrow the, the king? No, because that's God's anointing. David himself said, I will not touch God's anointing. God was in charge of who was the king. Just imagine Elijah, something so great happening. And then they're just fizzling it out so quick. They're thinking, well, Lord, was it me? Did I do it in the wrong spirit? Should I have said something different? Thankfully, the Lord sent an angel with a cake, sent some ravens by with some food. Pretty good meal because he lasted 40 days on it without eating anything else. Then eventually he gets down and he hears that still small voice says, hey, everything's okay. You did what you were supposed to do. Third example. So I'm thinking about people that did right. We go from Joshua to Elijah just think of what it would have been like you've done everything that you're again Joshua he's got the, he studied the law he studied what God wants him to do he studied all the problems week in week out you come in asking God Lord give me today what I need to get through the rest of the week so that when I read that verse tomorrow morning in my daily devotion you'll have prepared my heart today so that tomorrow I can receive it Right, You are seeking after God. Trying to do everything that you can. And then still sometimes bad things just happen. Before we get to the 30 them, Elijah, Joshua, both of them learned a lesson. Nothing is stronger than God's will. But God will not force His will. The will of God is dependent on people following Him. You know what caused sin to get in the camp? Achan decided that he's going to do what he wanted to do. Or he convinced himself that taking those things didn't go against what God had commanded. Joshua relayed the commandment. Don't take nothing. All the people that Joshua told, told everybody else. There was no breakdown in communication. Everybody knew and understood, don't take it but somebody took it. And that person didn't understand that their consequences affected more than them. Wouldn't it have been justice if Achan was the only one that died when they went out to fight AI? But no. Some people don't understand. When you don't follow the will of God, it causes other people's lives not just to be affected, it can cause their lives to go wrong. Elijah thought that everybody would choose. It just made sense to him. You just saw the manifestation of the power of God. Why wouldn't you follow him? But some people did. Just because you do right doesn't mean that everybody else does right. But what did God promise Joshua? Verse number 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. And then verse number 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. That's what we're talking about, that word dismayed. If you do right, don't let other things steal your hope. Don't let other people steal your faith. Don't let other people shake your confidence in God. Because God's will isn't always followed by everybody else. And if others don't do according to the will of God, it's going to have an impact on you. On your life. On the things around you. But don't let it affect you spiritually. Is what God's saying. God knew that Achan wasn't going to obey. Why do you think he said, Be thou not dismayed? For a moment, Joshua got a little dismayed. He ran his clothes. He went into the temple. He's sobbing before God. Lord, what went wrong? 
What did we do? And he said, you didn't do wrong, but there's sin in the camp. Go find it. Then, it all makes sense. He says, oh, Joshua again. Well, God said it. Why wouldn't somebody do it? He couldn't comprehend how if God said something, somebody else would do something different. And we have the capability to do that, that everybody thinks like we do. Or everybody is just as committed as you are. That may not be the case. And you may only find that out after something's gone wrong. Okay, third example. David. When he, when he did right. Not when he did wrong. He and his men are on the run from Saul. God provides a haven and a refuge in the middle of his former enemies, the Philistines. And one day, David and his men, they're doing as best they can to follow it. They've been living in caves. They've been scrounging for food. They've been having to rely on the mercy of others to get the things that they need. But all the time, God's always provided for them. They're in the middle of their enemies that used to had, you know, prices on David. Hey, if you can kill David, you'll be a rich man in the Philistines. Why? Because Saul had his thousands, David had his ten thousands. When David went into battle, God went with him. They said, if you could take that guy out, we might have a chance. And yet now, the people that used to hate him, now protect him against the one that God said isn't going to be king anymore. Isn't that just God? Don't you, I've always wondered, don't you just think that that might be where that part in Psalm 23 came from? Where he said, Thou preparest a table in the midst of mine enemies. He's surrounded on every side by people that used to hate him. Maybe people whose family members, David's armies were responsible for killing But all they can do is sit there and watch God bless them. And one day they go out, they've came to Ziklag, they go out and they fight a battle. Great victory. Everything has gone according to plan. And they get back, and everything they own, and all their loved ones, gone. Keep in mind, they're on a lamb right now. They're just waiting for God to take care of Saul, but they can't go back home right now. So everything that they own, they're carrying with them. They left the civilian clothes, so to speak, and they took up their armor and their weapons, maybe a canteen, a little bit of food, and they went to war, and they came back, and then what they were wearing is all that they had, because it's gone. Not to mention wives and children. Not to mention everyone that, you know, the cook, everybody, all their friends that had come out and said, no, 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 David's the next king, and we're going to follow him. They's all taken away. Very famous verse that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Amen. You know what that means? He was dismayed, but he said, I'm not going to be dismayed. I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. In the midst of all of his men being brokenhearted and so full of grief that some of them were whispering, you know what? If this is what following God gets us, why don't we just kill David? And then maybe take his body back to Saul and say, hey, we're sorry, but can we, can we come back? Can we come back home? Following David, we lost everything. And I can't judge it. I've never been in that spot. I don't know what I'm capable of in those, those situations. But you know what I do know? David said, boys, give me a minute. First he encouraged himself in the Lord, then... He prayed unto the Lord. God told him, hey, go after him. You'll recover everything. And they did. Nobody lost. And they took all the spoils that, not that, not all the stuff that they owned, all the stuff that the other people owned, they came back with it. But in that story, I'm thinking about those guys that were too weary, that stuck by the stuff. All the men, as they come back in, doesn't say that the men encouraged themselves in the Lord. David knew how to do that. But imagine all those men. They're on cloud nine. Man, did you see the way that God you know, worked everything out today where we were victorious? Yeah. And then they see the smoke on the horizon. Well, hey, they must have got the word. They got a big bonfire going. They're, they're ready to receive us back. 
until they get there and everything's burned. The closer they get and they realize, oh, I don't hear any music. I don't hear any chatter. I don't hear any you know, pots and pans banging. I don't hear kids running around and laughing. And the closer they get, the more it sets in. And then the thought, whether it's your flesh, whether it's Satan, tries to put that wedge in there that says, maybe this is your fault. You sure you did everything right? You sure that you followed all the instructions? Are you sure that you haven't regarded iniquity in your heart? Are you sure that you've put God first in your life with everything? And eventually they realized, yeah, they had done everything right because God returned and then some. God took that tragedy, or tragedy and turned it into a blessing. But in that moment, they're sitting there and they're dismayed. Those men that stuck by the stuff, I, I don't look down on those guys at all. Some of them were probably injured in the battle. Maybe not, you know, missing an arm or something. But I've seen a lot of guys play a football game and then the next day they're out of commission because they gave it all that they had. That it's all they can do to put on them little slip-on shoes and then get the films in the next morning. Why? Because they left it all on the field. They gave it everything. Some of them may have just come back and their spirit was so broken seeing everything that they loved taken that they just couldn't go. I can't judge. Them. Yeah, I don't look down on them guys either. Those boys had a serious case of the depression until God got rid of it for them. But they stuck by the stuff, meaning we realize that this stuff's still worth protecting. Even though something bad's happened, we're not turning our back. We're here, but we just can't go another mile. So we'll stay here and we'll hold what we can. But can you imagine while David's out there and the rest of the men are pursuing the enemy, going to get back everything that was taken, and they're sitting there by the stuff thinking, well, you know what? Lord, is there something that I did? They're already broken hearted. They can't go. That's how down they are. Can you imagine just their flesh beating on them? Because I know how mine beats on me. How long did it take them to get to the point where they weren't dismayed anymore? All right. Normally I don't do this. Very private individual. I don't like people in my business because it's mine, not yours. But every now and then, if God tells me to, I will share a story. Uh, while y'all was boarded up during the COVID, some things happened, lots of things. Anyway, 4-A-Bit uh, dated somebody. And about, oh, four weeks in, I get rear-ended, get a paycheck because they gave me about twice what my car was worth. Hallelujah. God either gave the dumbest adjuster over there or the newest one, my case, and then I got payday. Anyway, uh, had money. I know me. I'm going to spend money if it's in a bank account. That's just how I am. I can't help it. Well, I probably could, but mm, don't want to. <laughs> right, but God had been working on me. Long story about how it all started. Long story short, I got under conviction that I needed to text somebody, and then when I did, I was like, well, I'm never going to hear from that person again. And then two months later, I'm dating them. And, but, but this is me we're talking about here. Okay? So God didn't give me a verse. God gave me three verses because I got my mom's strong will and my dad's hard head. Don't tell mom I said that, but it's true. You guys know her. If she's right, nothing in heaven or earth can move her. Okay? So I got both of those, which means I'm, you know, doubly bad. So not one, but three, Brother Brian. I went out and dropped around five grand on an engagement ring, Brother Brian. Yeah. If anybody wants to buy an engagement ring for $5,000, by the way, let me know. I'd be more than happy to give it to you. Uh, try and sell it back. Actually, got a few people at the jeweler that, you know, did everything for me. Looks like I'm going to make a profit on this deal, okay? I'm going to make money on this. Anyway. 
Long story short, one Tuesday, everything's fine. By Friday, I don't want to talk to you no more. You say, well, how'd that happen? It's a long story. But uh, our tent revival that eventually ended up getting canceled because of the COVID was coming up. And the question came up, well, how many nights are you going to that? This is Jordan you're asking that question to. I didn't know that that was an issue. I said, how many nights are there? Because that's the answer. And then somewhere along the line, the comment, I just don't think that I need to be there every time the doors are open. Uh, you need to read your Bible. I can give you a few verses. I didn't say it that way, but that's what I was thinking. Okay? And then, once someone realized that the thing that my dad has preached for years, that you know, man's only, ministry is only ever as good as his wife, because she has to be there for him, thinking that when that dawned on her, uh, then that was on a Tuesday, by Friday, I'm out. Okay? That Friday, but they hurt, yeah, but that's not what shook me. But Josh, it's, I don't know, about six o'clock. I came out there to the rock altar for about four hours just asking, Lord, did I miss it? Did I think that you gave me three verses, but I found three verses? I was dismayed. Because see me, okay, it's the will of God, I'm going to do it. And I had to learn the same lesson that Elijah learned. That Joshua, just because you did, didn't mean that other people are going to be doing according to God's will. And as I was down there sitting there at the rock altar, shaking, because there's like over a month's worth of Sunday school on YouTube right now of me talking about the things. I'm sure there's something in there that I'd take back if I knew that I said it. Okay? But I do try my best to say and teach according to the will of God. I do do my best to do what God would have me to do. And when, I'm, especially if I get up and I, you know, the pastor were to come to me and say, hey, you taught something that was wrong, it would, it would break me. That's how much I want to do what God says. So the very thought that I launched out and was about ready to ruin my life, and it wasn't the will of God, that shook me. And I'm down there at the rock altar praying. God, you know, eventually smacked me upside the back of the head and said, hey, I gave you three because you knew that one wasn't going to be enough. I was like, okay. And right about then, this goofy squirrel that kept distracting me the whole time I was down there. The trees down there don't make a circle, but he found a path through the branches that made a circle. And he was just running in circles the whole time. Squawking. But every now and then, that squirrel would get to a branch that didn't connect to the next tree. And he'd go way up high and he'd just jump to the next branch. I'm not convinced that he knew which branch he was going to land on, but he knew I'm going to jump towards that tree and I'm going to find a branch. Never missed once. Four hours. Sucker just kept running. He kept making laps, which means he kept finding twigs. And some of them I'm thinking, that, that's not going to hold him. That's a small one. He, he makes it and he just kept going. Never hit the ground once. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you jumped and expected somebody else to catch you. But if you do what I said, you jump, I'm always going to be the one that catches you. Just because you jumped and the one twig that you thought wasn't going to, you know, was going to hold you didn't, furthest that you can fall in the will of God is right into God's hand. I was thinking... You know, we get so focused on climbing the mountain. Right on face, you just, ever, just trying to get a little bit higher up the mountain. If we slip and slide about 10 feet down the hill, we think, oh man, I failed. And God said, hey, turn around and see how far up the mountain you've come. Amen. 10 feet backwards is still all the way up this mountain. Be not dismayed. Because when it all goes wrong, even though you're right, it can ruin you. It can get you out of the will of God Amen. because in emotion, in pain, in confusion, maybe in doubt, you get to the point that you say, well, if it didn't work at this point, what's the point? Or, well, if none of that worked, well, then maybe we should do it a different way. You know why a lot of churches turn from this one? 
because they did right and it went wrong and somebody stepped in and said well you weren't doing it the right way encouraging yourself in the Lord is going back to them verses that he gave you going back to those hallmark messages that you've heard going back to those times when you was on your knees and broken hearted and God just stepped in and gave you peace in those moments where you didn't know which way was up and God said, hey, you don't need to know. I know which way's up. Just come underneath of my wings for a little bit. Be not dismayed means take what God's done and convince yourself again. Take all the things that God used to convince you yesterday, use them again today if you need it. Right, you want to know why God gave us the word? Because he knew that reading it to us once wouldn't have been enough. I'm forgetful. You're forgetful. But I can go back and I can say, you know what, I remember when that verse helped me. You know what, I remember what that verse did. I remember what that message meant to me back then. Maybe I just need to be convinced again. Remind me, Lord. The song that Miss May sings. Remind me that I did all according to everything that you said. I don't want sympathy. You come up and talk to me about it, I'm going to blow you off. Because I don't want people in my business. Right? But I'm fine. You know why I'm fine? Because I know I did what God told me to. That was a long time ago too. Like For me, it was, you know, I didn't even think about it until God said, hey, tell them about that. Why? I don't need to know that. Why? Because it hurts. I was pretty angry when I left the house too. Mom and dad said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the rock altar and then I slammed the garage door. They were like, oh, something's up. Now, by the time I left the rock altar, I was good. He said, why are you come out here? Because I've nailed some things down out there before. Now I'm back up. The Lord, remind me that even though I'm not perfect, I am enough to do what you said I was supposed to do. Just remind me that everything's okay and I'm good. I could care less, for the most part, what people think, how my relationship with other people go. As long as everything's good between me and God, I'm good. I don't care what other people think because all that matters is what God thinks. Some people call that arrogance. Some people call it overconfidence. Well, when I know I'm right, that's just how I am. But see, you know why Elijah did everything that God told him to do when fire came down from heaven? Because he trusted in God. You know what happened underneath that tree? He still knew that God was God. He lost faith that he was able to do what God wanted him to do. Joshua lost faith that, you know, these people, that he was the, he thought something was wrong with him. He said, Lord, did I do so? Maybe I'm not the one that's supposed to be leading us. David over there, he's saying, well, Lord, I know that you didn't let something like this happen for no reason. So what do I do? Do we go after him? Are you going to bring him back? Was, he knew God was... But he said, Lord, what do I need to do in all this? And instead of being dismayed, all of them got to the point where God settled it, reaffirmed it. They encouraged themselves in the Lord to get to the point where they say, no, no, no. Instead of being concerned about all this, what's God want me to do? Because the reason we get all them feelings, we don't see the other side like God already does. We don't see everything that God has planned. We don't see that we weren't the ones that did wrong, so we assume that it was us. But be not dismayed. When it all goes wrong, even though you've done right, don't give in to that feeling. Because that's a depressed, joyless, hopeless situation. Rather, the boat may be a little bit worse for wear, but the Lord will help you patch it up. Get back out there on the ocean. Keep sailing. Just because the light bulb burns out doesn't mean that the lighthouse shuts down. They put another light bulb in it. Amen. Be not dismayed. Because you could say, well, the light bulb burned. I thought that light bulb was going to burn for forever. Why would you think that? One. But two, those maidens, all of them, trimmed the wicks and put oil in their lamps. Because they knew that yesterday's oil wasn't going to be enough if the bridegroom showed up. Of course, the light's going to run out. What do you do? You fill up the lamp again. 
You put another light bulb in. You put more batteries in the flashlight and you keep going. Be not dismayed. Because if the light goes out, God knew it was going through. He's already got what you need. Get the light going again. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.